Are we live? Are we on? Hello world. Is Facebook working? Come on. Yes. All right, if you're joining us, sorry we uh, had a little bit of technical difficulty there. Didn't get it working quite right yet. Um, we're glad you're on with us live for Brown Bags and Bibles. Brown Bags and Bibles is Great Questions Redux, uh, which is a fancy word for re-envisioned and done differently um, for uh, COVID and post-COVID world. And uh, so what we did with Great Questions was Mark and I... Um, took questions and gave biblical theological answers to them. You took great questions and gave some answers. Man, a decent-ish <laughs> occasionally answers. Uh, great questions and uh, mediocre answers. Um, but we're going to be doing that now online in a way that uh, means that you can come back and see those uh, questions being answered over lunch on Tuesdays from noonish till 12:45 or so, uh, we're planning on going 45-ish minutes um, where we answer questions like today for the first brown bags and Bibles. Uh, to what extent is COVID-19 the judgment of God? So will this be recorded? You could watch it later. Or is yes. It? Yeah. Okay. We are doing it live now in a way that we can keep online. Uh, that will be recorded for later on. Okay. Um, a few folks have asked that question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, in case you don't know who we are, I'm Scott Wakefield, lead pastor here at First Christian Church. And you are? I'm Mark Liebert. I'm one of the elders here at First Christian Church. Yes, indeed. Um, Y'all have been around a dozen-ish years. Does that sound right? A little more than that? 2009, whatever that is now. <laughs> yeah, almost. Oh, a little more than it. Yeah, almost a dozen years. Um, okay. Good to see you all. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, let us know if you can hear us okay. Hey, Kendra. Hey, Sonia. Hey, Sylvia, Allison, Ben, Tommy, Colleen, Jennifer. Um, if you can't tell, we've asked the staff to watch. <laughs> How about um, Emery? Is she watching? Emery, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. If my seven-year-old is watching. Hello, Emery. How are you doing? All righty. So uh, let us know if you can't hear us okay. Um, let's go ahead and jump in just a second. We're going to pray, and then we're going to jump into this question of to what extent is COVID-19 the judgment of God. We're basically doing this in two parts. Uh, for the first half or so, um, we'll sort of do some biblical theological teaching and what does a Christian worldview say to this question, um, assuming that the Bible is the authority for all of those things. Um, so we'll just do some back and forth teaching on that. And then for the second half, uh, we'll ask you uh, to give us some responses and questions about this uh, particular issue and topic. So let me go ahead and pray and we'll jump in and I'll stop talking and you can start talking. Is that Does that sound like a good That's fine. way to start? Okay. <laughs> Lord, thanks for this time together. We're grateful for your word um, and that you give us guidance um, in a world where things seem uh, up in the air and uh, we have lots of questions and all those uncertainties bring on for us um, questions that don't have great and easy answers, at least in terms of what the world offers us, Lord. So uh, we want to take some time to uh, submit ourselves to what you tell us about who you are and who we are and how the world works. Um, so we submit ourselves uh, afresh to the authority of the word in our lives. Uh, thanks for that source and that resource for us where, where you speak to us. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So Mark Liebert... <laughs> Seminary educated. Uh, Mark and I went to the same uh, seminary, little known fact. Um, seminary, seminary educated Mark Liebert, tell us some of your first thoughts about to what extent is COVID-19 uh, the judgment of God? Sure. I, yeah. I, think, I think one of the key things when we have questions like this is to know your resources. So scripture obviously is our number one resource. Yep, yep. But there are also gifted people that God has put in time over the centuries to help us. Uh, you know, one of those, Ravi Zacharias just died last week. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I'm indebted to him personally for yeah. uh, an apologetics understanding of some of the harder questions around things like how is God good and yet there's evil and sin in the world. And he did he did that with truth and grace. Yes. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever watched him, but he always spoke to people with the respect that they were due as being made in the image of God, which is something we can learn right there. 
Um, R.C. Sproul was another one of the men that I looked up to. I read many of his books. I went to his conferences. He died last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, These are good and faithful servants who've gone before. But there are still many around. Um, And one of the resources that Scott and I used just in preparing for this was from John Piper, yeah. who also is getting up there in age, I noticed. Uh, yeah, and I think he's, he's 70. Mid-70s. Yeah, almost 74 or 5, something like that. And working through cancer. Or as old as my parents. Yeah. Yeah. But God is always faithful to bring those. So I just want to say that when we present things, a lot of the research that we do is based on knowledge of Scripture, first of all. Sure. And then those that God has gifted with brilliant minds to help us interpret that in light of the times that we're in now. And so I, we are indebted to John Piper for some of the material we're going to bring today. Yeah, uh, a really good book called Coronavirus and Christ, um, A Desiring God, I think is still yeah. free. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you can get it for free if you uh, want to grab some of that. Like it's I, great. I got the PDF version. That was free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so just setting that context because I think that's important. Uh, you know, everyone has resources. What are the resources you use? I, I think another one that's important is gotquestions.org. Yes. I, I go there all the time when someone says to me, <clears throat> what about this? And I could spend an hour pulling things together yeah. and culling from <laughs> scripture, or I could go to a website that is proven and I could look at what they have and think, yes, got it. Yes, yes. Mm, maybe that one I need to research a little more, but basically excellent information. And part of what you're getting at is the trustworthy of the sources we have yes. uh, and the resources we use. And uh, as you all know, we live in a, an age of info whelm where anybody can go online and yeah. anybody can read anybody. And there are more resources available than time. Yes. Um, and those are a few that we have been using over the years. Gotquestions.org is, is a pretty good site, trustworthy yeah. theologically yeah. in real, real good basic terms. Yeah. So I say that just because I want you to know that informs a lot of our understanding, at least mine personally. I know mm-hmm. Scott approves of those. But you also, it's got approved. You have the ability to look that up yourself and then test what you read, right? The Bereans tested what they heard against Scripture when Paul came and preached to them. So we always do that with every resource we have. I'm I'm reading through a systematic theology book by Wayne Grudem. Hmm. That doesn't mean it's it's all accurate, right? So you have to take that and run it through the filter of the grid of Scripture. But what we don't want is just people saying, "Well, this is what it means to me," or "This is what I think." Random thoughts that aren't based and rooted in scripture uh, and that are no one else is holding, <laughs> those are bad places to be. Yes. The, all the cults that you know were from people who had a little bit of truth, but then came up with their own ideas and nobody else was saying them. That, that's usually not a good place to be. Yes. And that makes me think um, of the importance of the humility in the process of uh, of what it means to learn from God. Um, the Proverbs make a, a very... A very fundamental point in saying uh, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It uses those words interchangeably in the Proverbs quite a bit, wisdom and knowledge. And that that fear and humility is, is, is part of testing one's own reading of Scripture with others uh, over the years who are gifted in those kinds of ways. Yeah, um, yeah many of whom are dead. Yes, <laughs> yes. I- I had a teacher tell me, choose heroes that are dead. Yes. They can't fail you anymore. That's right. <laughs> That's good. There we go. Sorry. All right, so, go ahead. But I just wanted to give a quick basic answer to this. Yeah. Because people always say, well, what's the answer? Yeah. Is, is COVID-19, is the coronavirus judgment from God? The basic answer is yes, but maybe not in the ways that you're thinking of judgment from God. So that's the answer with a teaser so you don't just log off and you stay <laughs> right, right. for yes. the rest of it. My, mine was similar. Yes, but. Right. Yes, yes and no. Right. Uh, it depends on what sense you mean by that. And yes. people come to that question with their with their preconceptions of what the word right. judgment means and, right. and who God is. Yes. Yeah. So, so yes, but let's let's couch that in some, some context. Yeah. So I wanted to start, and Piper does something similar, but I wanted to start with, let's get some overarching theological principles of how God works in the world. Yep. Because without that background, understanding how to answer that question is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So uh, just from the notes I have, God is good, righteous, and holy in all he does. Scripture says unequivocally he's good. No one is good except God alone. Jesus said to the rich young ruler in Revelation 15, just and true are your ways. And then uh, Isaiah 6, famous passage, holy, holy, Mm -hmm. holy is the Lord of hosts. So we must begin with God is good, he's righteous, and he's holy in all that he does. And three times holy, 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 holy is a way of saying completely, entirely holy. That's a, that's a Hebrew repetition in poetry kind of thing to say altogether as holy as possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That leads to he's sovereign 
in all the affairs of men and the creation as a whole, meaning God does uh, everything that happens is ordained of God in some sense. Other, otherwise, he is not sovereign. If anything occurs that is outside of the will of God in general, then he is not in control. That's impossible. Either he is God or he isn't. So, for example, Ephesians 1 says God works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things, including evil that people choose to do, God works all things for the counsel of his will. Isaiah 46.10, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So God is sovereign meaning there isn't one molecule running around randomly in this universe that is not under his control. That's a sprawl thing. That yeah, is there is there isn't quote. a random molecule in the universe. That's There's exactly no such thing. Right. Yeah. I love the fact that you picked up on that. Yeah, yeah. So what that means then is whatever happens is ordained of God. Now that doesn't mean God is pleased with everything and the choices that men make, but it does mean it is ordained by God under his control for his purposes. Deuteronomy 32:39. See now that I even I am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Unequivocally, the Bible says, God is sovereign in all the affairs of mankind and this world, and whatever happens is ordained of God for some reason. Now, mm -hmm. before we go on, <laughs> sometimes people struggle with that. Yeah. But Who doesn't? But here's the issue. If God is God, and we are limited... There is no possible way that we will fully comprehend all the purposes and the mysteries of God and what he's doing. He has given us insight. Yes. And our responsibility is to learn from that and operate from that. But the fact that we can't fully comprehend something actually points to the greatness of the existence of God, yes. not away from it. Yes. There's that middle that we want to know, that we feel like we should know. That's part of what was the... The, the desire to get to the tree of the knowledge right. of good and evil in the first place, uh, by which we all ran amok, right. <laughs> uh, Romans 5, etc. Well, Genesis 3. Um, and, and real quick, let me piggyback off of some of that real quick and say there's a, there's a classic uh, way of formulating uh, God's will into um, decorative and preceptive will of God. Um, the decorative will of God is, is God's decree in who he is, from his character and nature, from eternity past, that is known to him alone, um, that comes to fruition in time, in reality, for human beings, um, in his preceptive will. Precept is just a way to mean a, uh, to, to speak of his precepts, his commands, his purposes and promises. And so that comes to us in scripture. Um, and so that's the way that his decorative will comes out preceptively. But there's but there's a huge gulf between a perfect, God. holy, infinite God, like you mentioned, and our understanding of his purposes. Right. Um, that's the hard, messy middle for us. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so, yes, God is sovereign. Yes, whatever happens is ordained of God. Next thing, God's glory is at stake in everything he does. Uh, Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. Yes. I will be exalted among the nations will be I will be exalted in the earth uh, the be still there in the Hebrew has a little bit of a language of uh, y'all just chill out human beings who don't understand everything like quiet the voice right. yeah <laughs> and then God says whatever he does he does for a good purpose this is a critical element of understanding evil in the world or disaster or coronavirus mm -hmm. if it's ordained of God which it must be or he's not God Right. Can God still be good in the middle of what appears to be disaster or evil or pain or suffering? And the answer is yes, because God's purposes are not our purposes. So the classic example in scripture is Joseph's brothers sold him for yes. evil purposes and evil motives into slavery in Egypt. Years later, he meets his brothers. They're trembling in fear for what he's going to do to them. And he says to them, as for you, my brothers, you meant it as evil against me. Right? Their motives were sinfully wrong. And then he says, but God meant it for good. Now, yes. he doesn't say God used it for good. Right. He says God meant it for good, which means God's purposes were being fulfilled all along, before, during, and after. It wasn't, oh, no, his brother sold him. Now what do I do? It was they made evil choices. That is within the plan of everything I'm doing. They're responsible for it, but I will use it for good. Yes, hard words. When you get into the Hebrew of that passage, um, there's a very clear parallelism uh, in, in Genesis 50, 20. Um, and, and there's a sense in which the entire book of Genesis can be spoken of in these kinds of terms with this theme of um, 
God creates the world good to be given to his purposes as you are fruitful and multiply. Um, and then, of course, Genesis 3, where um, the fall um, and some, yeah, stop adding too much, Scott. So by the end of Genesis 50, 20, um, you get to this place that's a summary of this whole book. And the parallelism in the, in the Hebrew says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So there's a very clear difference between um, what humans mm -hmm. intend and what God intends mm -hmm. that speaks to that messy middle that's hard. Right. So, yeah. so everything that happens is ordained of God. We may not understand all of it, but we can, we can have this rock that his purposes in it are good. To bring many people yes. to and, be kept and let's, alive. And let's name what those are. In Genesis, it was specifically to save people through the famine. Sure. Another good example, um, in Acts, the disciples are praying and they say, Pontius Pilate and the rulers of the Jews conspired yes. together. It uses a word that's conspire for evil, conspired together against your anointed one. In other words, they put him to death. But then it says, but you had planned this all along, yeah. which your predetermined plan had, had invoked. So what is it? The they lifted their voices together and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and sea and everything in them who through the mouth of our father David your servant said, Why did the Gentiles rage? For truly in this city were gathered against your servant Jesus, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Yeah. That's the combination yeah. of... God has a perfect plan for his glory and for our good because he is unstained and unpolluted in any way. Which God are not necessarily con in, in as much conflict as no. we think or no. feel. But it's done <laughs> through a broken world where people make sinful choices for which they are responsible. Which is more amazing. Right. And so now how can God do it? I, that, that, messy, that messy middle we can't explain. Right. But what we're saying is the Bible is unequivocally clear that God has ordained everything that comes to pass. That must also apply to the coronavirus. There is no other option. And at the end of that passage in Acts 4, well, toward the beginning and at the end, they continued to speak the word of God with boldness, despite not right. knowing everything. Right. Despite not having all the answers that yeah. they want. And yeah, this brings incredible security, safety and peace when you grasp this. That is that men will do evil People will choose wrong. They may harm me. They may harm others. Disasters may occur. Disease may come. Sure. Suffering and pain is inevitable. And yet, God has a purpose and a plan for all of it, mm -hmm. not as a surprise to him, but as part of his ordained will to accomplish things that are beyond my ability to understand, which bring him glory and are for our ultimate good as his people. Yeah. That is a bedrock foundation from which to live. And the coronavirus is similar. So, my... Opening statement here, Scott, is yes, God has ordained that the coronavirus come in 2020. Yeah. And it will accomplish what pleases him, which is both for his glory and for our good. Anything you would add or change to that statement? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So do you want to jump into, so what are some yeah. of the specific things God what, is doing? What are the things that God's doing through the coronavirus? Um, these are uh, called from this uh, book that we mentioned earlier, Coronavirus and Christ by John Piper. You can get it free at DesiringGod.org. Um, and he, he outlines a number of things that I think are helpful for us to think about that answer this question about um, what God is doing this through the coronavirus. Um, and some of those answers also help answer the, to what extent is the coronavirus the judgment of God? Right. Because we've talked around some of that, right. um, and we haven't gotten no, entirely to that. So. Not specifically. No. Yeah. So the first is that it shows us the ugliness of sin as a picture of the moral um, horror that um, it is, which is to say um, <clears throat> that the effects of sin in the world uh, of others against us, of us against others, of which are all about ultimately us against God, uh, first and foremost. <clears throat> uh, the presenting pieces of the consequences of sin that we see and experience are not the main problem as much, like you right. were talking about forth is God's holiness, as as it is the sin against God. So what, what that means is all sin has a, an effect and a consequence that we feel that shows us the ugliness of our sin against God. Right. Yeah, Pipe, the way Piper pointed it out was it's it's difficult for us to grasp 
intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally how bad sin is against God. Right. Like, like we just, right. we don't get that no. because we don't see God. We don't understand his holiness. Well, All apparently we, we didn't get it before, if we know Jesus, apparently we didn't get it then. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so we have a limited ability to, to grasp just how holy God is and how awful our sin is. And so one of the ways God shows us is through the physical realm. So pain and suffering and disaster we experience and we feel at a deep level physically. And Piper's point is that points, because it's a clear picture for us as physical beings, that points to a deeper reality, which is sin is an abject horror against the character of God. First and foremost. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's where it needs to begin. Uh, so all disaster and pain and suffering that we experience in this life is judgment from God generally. I would just go to Romans 8. Mm -hmm. Paul says the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, God, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Which is to say that there's a sense in which God has set up the world so that suffering and pain points to his holiness exactly in a way right. that we have to depend upon. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And, and, it, and we, we don't like to name and live from that truth. We no. suppress that. Right. It, it's actually the mercy of God that we experience pain and suffering and evil because it points to the fact that something is broken. Right. And if we didn't have that, we would have no need for God, no recognition of yes. him. Who cares? But, but pain that I experience physically makes me cry out, why? What's going on? What's broken here? And then the next verse, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. This is interesting, the words mm -hmm. Paul uses. Yes. He says futility. He says uh, bondage. He says corruption. He says groaning. He says pain. That's what this world experiences because of sin. And it was God's judgment, he says, put upon us. Which was set in motion at the beginning of uh, Genesis when he talks about the curse, pains of childbirth, all of that is going to be um, what points us to, um, and we could talk about the relationships between men and women uh, there. Yep, that's that's a parallel that's to going to God. That's yes. why marriages are hard. That's exactly right. Because, <laughs> Let's not talk about all yeah. that. Yeah. But uh, here's a paraphrase for this first point. So it is a wake up call from God to see the ugliness of sin for what it truly is. Why are we suffering? Why is there pain? Why is there death? Because God wants us to be aware that sin is real. He hates it. And it's much worse than we know. So this in this world, we experience judgment and pain and frustration and disaster and cancer and everything else. Generally speaking, so mm -hmm. far we're still speaking generally. Yes. The general judgment of God on the world because we chose to rebel against him. Right. So we interpret coronavirus and other things that are in the forefront that we notice in the here and now as judgment insofar as they are the the personal experiences of that larger problem of sin that is going on in the world right an easy way to put it is if adam and eve had, ne had never sinned if sin was never introduced would coronavirus be here and the answer is simple no right no right so it is part of the overall judgment of god the consequence of our rebellion against him and him saying okay that's what you choose then the creation will be frustrated Yes. And this is one of the experiences of that. Yes, the frustration of creation is a, is a theological thing that a lot of people talk about um, that was set in motion from Genesis uh, 3 on. Uh, that's a part of God saying, then you are going to have to experience this kind of a world with the consequences of your sin um, direct you to me. Right. Um, so the judgment of God uh, is something that is the natural consequence of, of that fall. Yeah. yeah. And it should, it should point us to God that something is broken, we need him. Yes, That's the we intention. need him. Yes. yes. But many people harden their hearts nonetheless. All right. Uh, we got to move. You've got the second one. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> second point. So the first one was he's showing us the ugliness of sin by the judgment on the world as a whole. But there is a sense in which God is specifically judging some. Now, here's the tricky part. Why do we know that? Because Herod, for example, in Acts, yes. he received the praise. It's the voice of a God, not man. He did not quell that, and he was struck down instantly. That's um, Hebrews 12, 23. He was struck down. Uh, Acts 12, 23. I'm yeah. sorry, Acts 12, 23. So, so we know that there are times where God brings direct judgment on specific individuals for their sin. 
Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms right. and breathed his last. Right. Sorry, Herod, I don't mean to laugh. Right. Now, <laughs> but there's also suffering where it's clearly not for specific sins, such as Job, who suffered, sure. and the Bible's clear that he had not sinned, right. or Paul, who received a thorn in the flesh, yes. and it was simply to keep him humble and dependent upon God. Yes. It wasn't for something that he was he was sinning in. I prayed three times right. for God to take it away, and he did not. That's specific and personal. Right. Yeah. So, so, the, so the, the, this answer here is, is the coronavirus specific judgment on specific people? The answer from the Bible is yes, but we don't know whom. That, I mean, there's no way for me to tell. I can't say this person got coronavirus right. just because it's part of the overall curse. At that point, you're getting away from what uh, we as unholy beings right. are warranted to be able to say. Right. Yes. It's not within our realm to be able to say this person's suffering is directly a result of their sin against God. Right. But does God do that? Yes, because yes. we have examples. Now, Christians get caught up in that mess. That's the hard part of judgment. Uh, Romans 8 again, it says, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul is saying, it's not just the overall world or universe that's subjected to frustration. We also suffer those consequences, even as believers in Christ, which even like, with the first fruits. Which like the pushing us toward a dependency upon a holy God who can do what we are not is a parallel to our readiness and preparedness for Christ's return. Yeah. Uh, that subjection to futility that we experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The difference here, when Christians get cancer, when Christians get caught in tornadoes and die, whatever that is, Christians are not experiencing the wrath of God against their sin. Why? Because that was poured out on Christ. Right. It says very specifically in Scripture Jesus saves us from the wrath to come. Which doesn't mean we don't experience the subjection nope. to facility and frustration right. of creation here and now, but it doesn't mean it does mean we don't experience the ultimate uh, consequences of that wrath right. and judgment. Yes. So it, it has a it should have a purifying effect on a Christian's life, but not a judgmental effect. Unless unless there is discipline from God because that Christian has unconfessed sin in their life, which Hebrews talks about. Which, let's be real, uh, gets again into that realm of things that only a holy, perfect, all-knowing, right. um, all-present God can manage and handle. Right. Yes. So just to sum up, yes, it is. <laughs> it shows the ugliness of sin and God's judgment on the world as a whole. Number two, yes, sometimes it is divine, specific judgment against the sin of specific people. But you and I... Do not know who that is. Yes, and, can that right. and the conjecture toward that end is not our place. Right. Except the one thing we must do is search our hearts to see if there is unconfessed sin. Right. Because if there is, James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Which implies there is time suffering is a direct result of our sin. But again, well, Scott, not as lead pastor, doesn't know who that is. I don't know who that sure. is. I know my wife and family have suffered because of my sin. People close <laughs> around me do. <laughs> and I and I am aware of that and they experience it too. I mean, a little. Um, What's but, another reason? But, but the calling everyone to repentance yes. thing is, um, is, I think, pretty important here. Um, there is a time and place for God to make clear, as he does in Scripture, as you've said a few places, um, this is what this judgment means and why. Um, that's not our place. But... Our seeing the subjection of creation to futility and that frustration that we experience is its own call to our own repentance and our own warning for our own sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that's how we should be interpreting what goes on in the world around us. Um, yeah. So yeah. the coronavirus is. Scott said it earlier. It's preparing us for Christ's return. We must be ready when He comes back. Scripture says over and over: Be prepared, stay awake, be ready. Yep. So that you don't shrink back from him in shame at his coming, First John two twenty eight. So the coronavirus is a way of preparing us. Yes, it purifies and refines us. Yes, and I and I think that's a um, that's a twist in thinking and perspective, not a, a perver perverted twist, but a, a good change in thinking about what we see in the world around us as believers. Um, it's it's easy to go hur and hur. Um, we should be seeing those things and recognizing, man, the world is broken. Yeah holy cow, this place is messed up in these people and, and our world. And, and, and processing that as our own um, 
pointing toward what we need to get right with God moment. Right. So if I can jump off that, the there's an interesting dialogue in Scripture that happens with Jesus when some people came to him. This is in Luke 13, 1 through 5. I'll just pull that up here briefly. So this is what the Scripture says. And this is There were some present at that very time who told him, so some people came to Jesus and said, hey, did you hear what happened? Is this Luke 13? Luke 13. Yeah, okay. They told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Not sure what happened exactly, but right. Pilate killed some people and then in some way made a sacrifice with their blood. Yeah, and I don't even think we know from history, extra biblical sources. I'm not sure we actually nope. know what went on. I can't remember nope. that well. But. but whatever it was, it was an evil act of Pilate where people suffered greatly and their lives were lost. Yes. And, then, and everybody was aware of that part. Yes, everybody heard about it. It yes. made the news. Did right. you hear what Pilate yes. did? Yes. Yeah. And then Jesus says this, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I mean, that's our normal thought is, well, I wonder what they did to deserve that. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, no. I tell you, unless you repent, you will yeah. all likewise perish. Yes. And then he brings up another current event that he'd heard of, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam felled and killed them. So this is a natural disaster. Right. This is an accident, a freak of nature. Right. So a human-related and motivated disaster. That's the first one. And then a what we call natural disaster. Right. Right. Uh -huh. So then he says... Which is a funny term. Really. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Right. And again, he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So here's what's fascinating. When there are disasters like the coronavirus, whatever it is, Jesus would say to us today, instead of focusing on their sin, what did they do to deserve that? Jesus would say, take those fingers and point them inward and say, unless I am right with God, I too will perish. And it is only the patience of God that I am still here and it hasn't happened to me yet. So this is where Scott was saying, the coronavirus should be a call to repentance. On my part, Mark, I need to look inwardly to, am I ready for the return of Christ? Is there unconfessed sin? Because at some point, the judgment of God will not be stayed any longer. Now, thankfully, as a Christian, it's been put on Jesus. But is my heart harboring unconfessed sin? Do I love something more than Jesus? Wealth, entertainment, security, significance, yeah. family, whatever it is, do I love something more than Jesus? That is the call to repentance that I feel. All right. Um, there are a number of other verses that we could talk about in terms of the call to repent when we see suffering and pain and uh, the brokenness of the world. Um, I think I think that is a key piece to draw out from our current circumstances. Um, <laughs> it's easy to go toward who's to blame and why. Um, and those, again, get at the kinds of questions that are only answered by a holy, perfect, infinite God of the universe. Right. Um, but I think an important theme for believers is um, how do I filter my current circumstances and the brokenness of the world in a way that directs me toward um, a dependence upon a holy God and my part in contrast to that yeah and if and if we do that if we process that well that is good that comes out of this already right it is a uh, for us for us for how we yes move on and how we interact with people in the here and now even in corona world anything that refines me or you to make us more like jesus ultimately brings glory to god and is for our ultimate good which is a part of how genesis fifty twenty, what you meant for evil mm -hmm. um god meant for good right I think, Scott, maybe one of the last things we can say is there is always the opportunity to do good when there is evil. And so we as Christians in the coronavirus should not be known for who we're for or who we're against. And Scott spoke to this a couple of weeks ago. If, if our focus is on everybody stay at home and wear a mask and the rest of you are idiots, or if our focus is on open the country <laughs> up now, the rest of you are mamby-pamby wimps. Uh-huh. That's not our focus in a godly way. Our focus must be on the opportunity to do good while the days are evil. So, yes. Right, Matthew 5, 16. 3, 15. Yep. Yes. Redeem yes. the time. Redeem the time. Matthew, let your light shine before men that they see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. 
So when disaster strikes, Christians should be the first not to take sides, not to indicate where I stand, mm -hmm. but to pray for God's mercy on those who are suffering mm -hmm. and to act in kindness to alleviate the suffering. Which is to which is to more accurately understand and recognize the messy middle between God's ability and human inability right. and to step in in a way that is that incarnational middle emptying Philippians 2 uh, that God modeled for us yeah. that we are called to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, to this, which is, we are called. this is God's judgment. Don't try to stop it. They need to suffer it. But look at that. Think about that in terms of the sin of the world. We rebelled against God. He subjected the world and the creation to frustration and bondage to decay and corruption. So that was of God. That is ordained by God when mm -hmm. we suffer. Mm -hmm. And yet God sent Jesus to correct it, to fix it. Right. So God sent both the judgment and the ability to alleviate the suffering of the judgment. He sent both. So it is not contradictory for us to say the coronavirus is of God. And yet we, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, will act to alleviate that suffering and pray that it ends and pray that there is less death and people's lives are not ruined. That is something that pleases God. Mm -hmm. So we're just following his example in that. Yeah. So there's our yes, but our yes and no right. um, answer to the question of. Right. Um, it's complicated. Yes, of course it's complicated. It is uh it is in that what we've, what we've been calling the messy middle between God and humanity, um, which makes sense that it's messy. Um, if you think about infinity with finitude and, and holiness with sinfulness, um, it makes sense that there's a big messy middle. So that's why it's a, it's a tension. It's a yes and no. It's a yes, but... Um, so one question that someone asked here, um, beautiful woman um, out there in the internet world, um, my wife, Dagny. I think we all figured that. <laughs> we were all hoping you were going there. Or, or, or your mother. One of my daughters. Or <laughs> your daughters. <laughs> mothers, mother, mother-in-law. Um, question was, um, I just, by, okay, here it is. Um, how can we manage the fear of the unknown? And I think that unknown is that that difficult unknown between God and us. Um, what what are these things going on, and how am I meant to manage meaningfully in a world that stresses the bejeebers out of me? Mm -hmm. um, we just had a um, an hour and a half long staff meeting where there was this palpable sense of man, we're dealing with a lot here. Um, so, it's your wife. You better answer it. Yeah. <laughs> How do we manage the fear of the unknown? Um, I think we manage the fear of the unknown based on some of the things that are known. Yeah. And um, so that's why the authority of the scriptures in our lives is so important. Earlier we were talking about the decorative and preceptive wills of God. Um, the decorative will of God is God's purposes from eternity past, from his heart, in his mind, that come from his holiness um, that are that Genesis 50, uh, 20 thing that he alone is aware of and knows. But the preceptive will, and the important distinguishing factor between that is the preceptive stuff is the, the commands and promises of God that we know. Um, so um, we alluded to a couple of those. Um, this gives us the opportunity to do good. So ironically, interestingly, I think managing the fear of the unknown is operating in a way that's from what we know, which is Matthew 5. Uh, this is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount um, saying, here are the marching orders for what it means to meaningfully participate in what I'm doing in the world. That's what he's saying in those um, in those three chapters, roughly. And so he says, let your light shine before others, which I assume means in a place of darkness, frustration, where there's pain and suffering. So if you are stepping into a, a place or um, saying something in a relationship or taking care of somebody's physical needs in those ways that are letting light shine, you are operating in the way that you, that, that you know Jesus has said, do this. Um, so I think we manage fear of the unknown. <laughs> In part, and this is a simplistic answer after all of that <laughs> parenthetical, complicated theological stuff. Uh, this is a simple answer of saying, do what you know is good and helpful and right and comes from the heart of God. That's part of how you manage fear of the unknown. Yeah. And, and uh, 
you work, as Scott said, from the known to the unknown. So what's the known? What are the promises of God that anchor our souls in the tribulations of life? Well, that's where you have to know the scriptures. I'm not saying Dogney doesn't. I'm just saying generally <laughs> we must do that. We must know the scriptures because those are the promises that we draw life from. Things yeah. like the entire chapter of Romans 8. We know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good. For those who are called to, according to his purpose. Four verses later, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God has given us the best he has, his son, then he'll give us the other things as well. Uh, a few verses later, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And this is where you can add pandemic in this list. Yeah. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or pandemic or nakedness or danger or sword? Mm -hmm. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. So the, the confidence for the unknown comes from what you do know. What you do know is that God is ultimately sovereign in every single thing that occurs. That's that foundation you live from. He is working everything for his glory and for our good. And those are mutually compatible. And he has already given us the best he has, which is his son. He's not withholding from us, right? right. Satan in the garden told Eve, God is withholding from you. You can be like God and know good and evil. That's not how God works. He doesn't withhold from us. Paul argues from the greater to the lesser. He gave us his son. So relax. So much more. He'll take care of everything else. And then Paul fleshes it out in Philippians. He says, live or die. Either one for me is gain. Yep. The worst that can do is they can take my body. Great, I'm with God forever in glory. Yep. It's like it, his foundation was God has met all of my deepest needs so I can trust him yes. for the lesser needs. Yes. That's good. That's good, good. Yeah. Um, in practical terms, uh, making sure we're not um, living from the fear of the unknown and we can manage the fear of the unknown. In some practical terms, it may mean something as simple as um, give your time less to taking in all of the sources of the world out there that make claims they can't, um, <laughs> that make claims they can't. How about that? Yeah. Let's just leave it there and um, continue to, to pour into uh, the word, um, the stuff you know, the truth of the gospel. Something we say around here is that you have to learn to preach the gospel to yourself uh, and to others around you. And that's the stuff that if God's taking care of the deepest need, the stuff I know is um, the, the worst problem I have, coronavirus, fear of the unknown. I'm going to be okay. I, um, I like what you said about don't constantly be taking in all of that which feeds the fears. Yeah. Uh, think of Philippians 4.8 where Paul says, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, excellent, praiseworthy, think, think. on these things. Yes. So there is an element where there's obedience involved here. If you struggle with fear or doubt yes. or worry or anxiety or, oh. or conspiracies. I was stop. up till 2 a.m. for the first four weeks of this thing. I'm an info hound. Um, so I was like, got all the graphs. Da, 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 da. Actually, I still am. I'm... I'm, I'm an info hound. But, um, but for me, I know that if I'm not um, feeding myself from truth every day right. um, in the mornings, uh, for me in particular, then yeah. my head is in a different place yeah. uh, that, that, that lets that subjection yeah. of futility take me in with it. Yeah. I mean, this may be as practical as stop watching the news every day, stop listening to NPR, yeah. stop reading Facebook and scrolling through it constantly. Tune into Brown Bags and Bibles mm -hmm. live Except every this. Tuesday. At <laughs> this is better. But, but I have loved ones in my life, and I have done the same thing, who have limited their usage of social media yeah. and other influences that aren't in and of themselves evil. But over a, while, over a while, they tend to influence the way we think in a way that I find destructive to me personally and they found unhelpful to them. Yeah, yeah. We do have to manage our, our sources of input. Right. In, in this world of info, well, we, have to, we have to learn to do that because, because everything that comes to us is mediated through something or someone yeah. or a worldview. Everything yeah. is. Right, Psalm 1. So blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand, stand in the way of sinners or, or sit, sit in the seat, seat of mockers. mockers. Right. But his delight is yeah. where? In, in law the of law Lord. of the Lord. And it's standing, uh, sitting, us. Uh, walking, <laughs> walking standing, 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 sitting. sitting. Right. In other words, you're walking in it and then you're standing in it and then you're sitting in it. Right. You're stuck. It's a, it's a progress. 
well, I was going to say progressive. It's a regression yeah. into a place where that becomes identifying of you. Right. But the other, but yeah. the opposite is his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. prospers. I and mean, there's David. It's, it, there's a reason that's Psalm 1. Yeah. It's Psalm 1 to set the trajectory of all of the Psalms, which is delight in the law of the Lord. So yeah. take a look at where we spend our time. In what do we delight? Your life will reap the fruit of what you delight in. Well, and to we've been spending way too much time on this one answer, and this needs to be the last but thing. But it's we need your to move wife, on. so. <laughs> we've got three others to get to quickly. Um, the Psalms and Proverbs have been uh, something that Christians over the centuries have had as a daily practice. There are 31 Proverbs. There are 150 Psalms. You can get through a proverb a day, a psalm a day, and do Proverbs once a month. Do the Psalms uh, once every five, uh, yeah, do the math for four months or so. Um, because that helps us manage uh, the things we cannot mm -hmm that are fear inducing right. yeah okay um let's see uh, another question that was sort of tangentially asked here was how do we sit and watch our loved ones suffer we've we've talked about that a little bit um we do what we can to do what we know is good and right and helpful for them you absolutely minister to their needs sure. just like the christians have done throughout the ages yes. always known for ministering to physical emotional spiritual needs despite where people were on Jesus or their relationship to God. Christians have always done that um, in culture, regardless of who it's for. Right. You be the hands and feet of Jesus. Even if the person is on a totally different side of coronavirus than you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a little bit of an answer to uh, one of those questions there. The that, that models Jesus in a way that gets at that messy middle yeah. tension and you do what jesus did as best you can which is you point them to the greater realities the deeper needs and the confidence they have that can be found in god alone yeah. so if your loved one is suffering you point them to their savior yeah so that it's not this is this is everything there is it's there is there is hope beyond this there is a god whose purposes are greater than you know and if he is holy and righteous and good then what he's working is for his glory and for your good you communicate that truth that's the preaching the gospel that despite the sin, God is gracious and good, and he redeems us from that. That means he will redeem everything for those, his children, who call in faith on the name yes. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that what we're doing is going to be used by God in his economy. In his ways. That only he can manage. And one day you'll find out. Regardless of our understanding of it in the here and now. And that's the faith which pleases God. The ability to walk through the messy middle and say, I don't understand right. what you're doing, but I trust your heart because I've read your word and I know your character. Yeah. I mean, th that's, that, good. that's true in every relationship, but especially so with God. Another question in a culture. I'll repeat this because it's from Tommy, so it's pretty long He's, and involved. And I don't trust that. Guy. In a culture, uh, Tommy is uh, our campus pastor at Afton. He's been with us for. 13 years and who knows what he's up to <laughs> hey tommy um in a culture that is not comfortable with being judged or with judgment that's that's good in a culture that's not comfortable with being judged or with judgment how can we process or balance this truth um, that we've been talking about this whole time with um judgment with a negative emotive response to judgment well we just answered some of that yeah uh, resting in the truth of what you know god alone can do so when you are uh, when you are accused of something, you needn't answer with something that will make that other person feel emotionally okay with everything. Mm -hmm. Or even yourself. Right. Ooh, that's tough. But that's, that's getting at what we just talked about in the doing what's good and right, uh, regardless of the unknowns. Yeah, it, it's similar... We have a tendency to water things down, to sugarcoat them, to try to make everything be better. That's yes. just our natural tendency. Yes. That is counterproductive. We don't want to come across as too judgmental. Right. That is counterproductive to God's purposes at times. So, for example, when, sure. we, when we present the gospel, we, don't, we should not present the gospel as there is a better plan for your life full of meaning and fulfillment where you can experience joy. Those are all <laughs> byproducts of knowing Jesus. 
Why yes. do you call people to Jesus? You call people to Jesus because without him, they're under the wrath of God for sin against a holiness that they cannot measure up against. Right. You have to feel that. You must feel your need first before you go to the doctor for medicine. And so sometimes we struggle because we want to lessen the pain that people feel. That's not the answer. The answer yes. is point them to Jesus in the pain because that pain may be actually ordained of God to get their attention. Um, there is a, a difficult balance here that requires wisdom. This is what Scott says when I come across too harshly <laughs> to black and white. <laughs> That's right. No. Um, <laughs> but I am very black and white. Well, different people, different people are gifted to do different things and say different things and, and right. act in different ways. So that, that, that's okay. Um, I, I can let God manage that. Um, but there is a wisdom issue in um, <clears throat> the extent to which we say something or do something that leads people into the pain that they're in denial of or unaware of if it has to do with these issues of repentance before God. Mm -hmm. um, and the extent to which we are just plain uh, hands off extending care, grace, mercy. Um, not that mercy and judgment are, are opposed to one another. Um, but I think there is a wisdom we, we have to, to manage here. And I think that comes with the context of the relationship, the extent to which we know the people well or not. Um, like if I am ministering to my neighbor who needs food because they're out of work, um, and they live in my neighborhood, uh, I'm probably not going to show up with a pie. And I don't know why pie is what I came up with, but I could use a pie. Um, I'm not going to show up with pie at the front door and uh, say, hey, man, sorry you guys are uh, struggling with uh, things well right fed. now. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're quoting yes. scripture. Um, be warm and well fed is where you leave it in that place. But ignoring their real needs. Yeah. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not coming back. Right. I'm not developing relationship. I don't have an angle that gets to the heart issues That's all along. Point. That's a good point. Uh, because... Um, you're because right. I think a lot of people leave it at no, the right about that. It's at the point. practical socially justice kinds of things and like, oh, that's it. Right. And right. we're done. Yeah, I was just looking at a quote by C.S. Lewis. Again, another person who can't fail us because he's very dead. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts yes. in our pain. I was thinking about that earlier. That's a great one. It yes. is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's good. To me, that's how that's the summary to me of the coronavirus. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Good. Some have hard hearts and will not listen, will not be roused, but others may. And if you are one of those where God is working on your heart, then listen to the call for repentance, for confession, and come to, to Christ, whether you're a Christian or not. And, if, and, and watch for those who are impacted that we may be able to speak to and point them to Jesus because it's doing something in them. The megaphone is being heard. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Good, good. Um, is there another question that we have here? I think it's over here. Is this? That is not a question. That is a three by five card with words on it. That is not a question. All righty. Hey, we are about to, uh, done with our time anyway. Um, unless you've got any quick last second questions to jump in uh, the comments or to text to that number that we uh, put there earlier. Um, we're going to close up here in just a second. Any closing thoughts you want to uh, put out there we covered um from the first the, the the question let's let's sort of summarize real quick to what extent is <laughs> clearly we're good at being quick and succinct um to what extent is uh covid19 the judgment of god we said some guiding theological principles are that you have to realize in the first place god is good he is righteous and holy in all that he does and he has control of all things um, and all events, all people, all things. Um, and that whatever happens comes from his character and nature as righteous and holy. Uh, which means there's this messy middle we're not clear about and aware of because we live in a broken world that does not reflect enough that truth of the righteousness of God that we just spoke of. Right. So... Um, so all pain, all suffering, yes. all brokenness is a result of the general judgment of God on us, generally speaking. Yes. All of it is. Yes. And somehow in Scripture, 
uh, there's that tension of God is good. Evil is not from and of him. Yeah. And that's the part where he uses it for his purposes, which are good. So I'll just repeat that summary I said in the beginning. God has ordained that the coronavirus come in 2020 and it will accomplish what pleases him, which is for his glory and for our good. Yes. Uh, what would you say in your mind is an ideal scripture or a passage that, um, and I've got one in mind in case you don't, but that encapsulates some of this first uh, theological stuff that we talked about. And then we'll give uh, some more of these specifics about what's God doing through the coronavirus in just a second. Well, here, but... Other than Genesis fifty twenty, but whatever you okay. have in mind. Um, I was going to say Romans 8. Just the, okay, yeah. In I mean, terms of our experience. Romans that. 8, 20 through 24, that section. Okay, so Genesis, like the whole book of Genesis, really. Um, and Genesis fifty twenty um, gets at some of that theological stuff that finds its... Uh, Practical expression in our experience in Romans 8, uh, really 20, yeah, 28 yeah. through the rest. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, in case you're looking at some scriptural handles there. Um, so real quickly to the answer of what is God doing through the coronavirus? We said he's showing us the ugliness of sin. Yes. Which is a piece of what God's judgment in the world means. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He's showing us the ugliness of sin. He's sending that divine judgment um, in terms that he can manage. Some will die as a direct result of God's judgment against sin, which is hard to hear. But I think that's part of what scripture says. God does this um, at times. Now, it, it's not our place. It's not our place to make those claims. Scripture making a claim about how God does that is entirely different than you or, or I right. making that, right. that specific uh, claim about. But that's only hard for us to grasp because we fail to see how holy God is. We're just so convinced that we're good and everyone's innocent, so why should people suffer? That's not what Scripture says. I, I'm, I'm there with scripture you. Scripture <laughs> says he's holy. We are not. Yeah. We need to think about that. Yeah. Ain't nobody perfect <laughs> other than God and Jesus. Okay. So we've said, um, what's God doing through coronavirus? Showing us the ugliness of sin, sending divine judgment, preparing us for Christ's return. Mm -hmm. um, meaning... Meaning it is yet another example of the ways that suffering happens in the world and the brokenness that's a result of sin points us to dependence upon God in yeah. the here and now and in the not yet. It's calling us to stay awake and be ready. Yes. These are all warnings to us. These are all warnings to us. Uh, which is another way of also saying calling everyone to repentance. Everyone, Christian and non-Christian alike. That's an important thing to say, Christian and non-Christian, yes. Uh, it's giving us the opportunity to do good. Um, of course, that's something we yeah. do In all the, the time. The suffering, the light shines brighter from Christians who are faithful. Yep. That's good. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. All I'm right. Piper if you want more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as we said at the beginning, um, you can go on to, I think it's desiringgod.org has for free uh, coronavirus and Christ um, that outlines a lot of this stuff that we've used as a resource for today. Um, it may not be where you are theologically and all these kinds of things, um, um, but we think that's a helpful place to start for us. That's a trusted resource. Um, we also mentioned gotquestions.org is a pretty good place to go to for some uh, general biblical theological questions. Um, and again, um, just to give you a smidge of vision for what we're doing in Brown Bags and Bibles Live, uh, Mark and I, uh, each week on Tuesday at noon, uh, sorry we got started a little bit early, uh, the goober in charge of the tech part of all this put it on the wrong Facebook page. What a, yeah. um, um, <laughs> so for the first few minutes, I'm looking like, where is it? Oh. It's on a different page. Um, so every Tuesday at noon, we're going to be meeting for 45-ish minutes um, to do in two parts an answer to a question um, that gives you biblical theological handles on that issue or question, and then that uh, spend the next half of the time um, giving some opportunity for feedback and questions um, that we will um, get to. And and we'll shorten this up. We This is our first time here, so we went a little long, but we have to... We'll figure that out. Yeah, sure. Besides, I have meetings at 1 o'clock every day. <laughs> which he has late. a job and he's late for it. Okay. Um, last thing, and then I'll pray real quick and we'll, we'll end here. Um, next Tuesday, June 2nd, we're going to be answering the question, what are the, whew, what are the proper roles of and relationships between civil government, the church, 
and the family. Uh, these are issues that have sort of been pressed upon in a coronavirus world. Who's in charge of what? What's my authority? Who do I listen to? Um, who am I following? Um, the truth is we're all under the authority of uh, someone, some institution, some thing. Um, so what are the proper roles of and relationships between civil government, the church, and the family, and how do those interact? Those are the three classic sort of ways that uh, Protestant uh, Christianity have defined uh, the authorities of the world. So uh, we'll talk about that next week if you will join us for Brown Bags and Bibles Live. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, let me pray and we'll uh, close up here. Father in heaven, thanks for these friends. Um, thank you for the chance to come together and uh, to reason together as you tell us in your scriptures so that uh, you could, through your spirit that's renewed, um, once hardened hearts, um, that you could speak to us and teach us your truth um, so that we could leave uh, our time together uh, better equipped to become who you've made us to be in the world. Uh, people who live in that messy middle um, that doesn't have all the answers for us in the here and now, but that trusts uh, that you're a good God and that you are um, using um, even these difficult circumstances uh, to communicate your, your goodness and your glory um, through us. So we step into that uh, trusting um, that what we do for that sake will be used uh, by you and for you. Give us courage and strength uh, to live from that truth. We ask this in the name of Jesus, uh, who gives us uh, grace as a gift from you that we don't deserve. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us, friends. Thanks for sharing, asking questions. We'll see you soon.